Our gospel lesson is found in the gospel according to John, chapter 12, beginning at verse 1. This takes place almost immediately following that time when Jesus raises his friend Lazarus from the dead. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put in it. Jesus said, leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you but you do not always have me. Holy wisdom, holy word, thanks be to God. So the Bible has all these stories about feet. Even the story of the prodigal son has a moment when someone is finding shoes for the lost and found boy. And I might be exaggerating, but feet come up in scripture more than you might think. For most of us, feet are awkward. We don't live in a place or a time where most people go about wearing sandals 12 months of the year. Most most people. (laughs) And I am yet to meet someone who says, I love my feet. If you're here, make yourself known to me after the service. And that makes sense. Like the heart, the feet are the body's workhorses. They bear a lot of responsibility, often a heavy load. And like the heart, uh, when there are problems, it can throw everything else off. Balance, safety, basic wellness. I've noticed that we become even more deeply uncomfortable about our feet as we age. And it might just be that feet are the distillation of all we dread about aging. Their shape changes in subtle or not so subtle ways. They might require more attention from doctors. And for women, they give us pretty strong signals that we better knock it off with shoes that are purely decorative and clothe them instead in something sensible that is kind to our arches and our backs. People are shy about their feet. I would go as far as to say people seem to really dislike exposing them to anyone for nearly any reason. So here we are in Lent, and looming ahead, coming on Maundy Thursday to a church near you, is a story about this essential part of our identity, Jesus washing his disciples' feet. And all over the world, churches will reenact this story, that story, on that day. And the people of God will endure the discomfort in the name of remembering something Jesus told us to do. But before that, we have another story, this story, today's story, a story having to do with Jesus' feet. The motivating question in the passage seems to be, what do you get the man who has raised your brother from the dead? I mean, what is an appropriate thank you gift? This part of the story about Lazarus being raised from the dead is in chapter 11 of John's Gospel. His sisters, Mary and Martha, sent for Jesus when Lazarus was sick, but Jesus delayed coming until after Lazarus died, and Jesus did it deliberately, and he tells us exactly why. He says, Lazarus' illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now, that sounds like 
Jesus is saying if he raises Lazarus from the dead instead of just healing him when he's sick, well, then he'll get more glory for that. And that is what he's saying, except Jesus doesn't mean what we mean when we say glory. When Jesus uses the word glory in the Gospel of John, he means his death. He means his crucifixion. He means that moment when he is lifted up on the cross and his arms are stretched out and he is gathering the whole world to himself. For Jesus, that is the moment when the Son of God is glorified. It's not our idea of glory, but it is his. Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead will reveal who he is. He is the Son of God, the Messiah, the Christ. It will also be a provocation to people who are threatened by his power, including the Romans, who brook no competition in the category most powerful. This will provoke them to call for Jesus' death. Jesus knows this, and he does it intentionally. And the sisters of Lazarus are aware of the danger hovering over all this, but still they are so grateful. How can they possibly thank him? Seriously, how do you thank someone for the gift of life? Do you simply say, thank you? I feel confident that has already happened in the story, most likely many times. Do you throw him a dinner party? Sounds like a good idea. And yes, that happens to be the exact setting for our story today. It takes place in Bethany in the home of Lazarus and Mary and Martha. There is a dinner there in Jesus' honor. Martha is serving. Lazarus is at table. But what else? How to say thank you? Isn't there some sort of grand gesture that could get the idea across? Mary of Bethany knows just the thing. She brings into the room a pound of nard, a thick aromatic oil distilled from the spike nard plant. She takes it, she anoints Jesus' feet with it, and then she wipes his feet with her hair. This is a startling thing to do. It's almost scandalous what she does for a number of reasons. First, the perfume. Spike nard is rare. It only grows between 9,800 feet and 16,400 feet elevations. So guess where that means you have to go to get it? The Himalayas. You have to go to China, Nepal, India to find this plant. It was highly prized in ancient times for that sweet, earthy fragrance. It was used as incense. It was used as perfume. It was expensive. The cost of that pound, 300 denarii, that was enough to pay 300 day laborers for a year. 300 salaries for people who dug ditches and planted fields and pulled in fish for a year. In addition, the scent of nard would have filled the room. Honestly, the little vial of frankincense I was showing the children if I poured that on my hand, it's only got about a third of an ounce left. If I poured it on my hand and rubbed it on my hand at the front of this congregation, you would smell it. No matter where you were sitting, you would smell it. It would seep out into the narthex. It's a powerful, powerful perfume. It would have lingered on the clothing of every person in that room. It would have remained that scent in that room as a memory for a long time. 
But the other part of Mary's action, the other part was equally stunning. She wiped Jesus' feet with her hair. Now, some have suggested that in ancient times, a woman's hair was considered the most magnificent part of her body, her crown. And in wiping Jesus' feet, Mary shows the ultimate humility in taking that which is her crown, the most gorgeous thing she has, and using it to wipe what is literally the lowest part on another person's body, their feet. The things that walk around in the dust and the sand and get dirty and get smelly. In every way, Mary's anointing of Jesus was an extravagant act of love and gratitude. Of course, not everyone sees it this way. Judas, who is here, and he's tagged as a troublemaker for us right away, he accuses Mary of wastefulness. He complains about the extravagance of the gesture. We could have fed the poor, he grumbles, and of course he's right. With that amount of money, he could have fed many, many people for a very long time. You always have the poor with you, Jesus responds. You will not always have me. Now, Jesus' response has been misunderstood. So I'll tell you some things that Jesus is not saying. Jesus is not saying there's no use worrying about the poor. Anything we do is just a drop in the bucket. He is not saying this is an unsolvable problem and anyway, I'm more important. He is not saying just don't worry about them. This is Jesus, who in another gospel says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because God has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. This is Jesus who feeds the poor and hungry, sometimes thousands of them at a time. This is Jesus who has singled out the poor for God's special care and blessing. And this is Jesus who it sounds like from what Judas said, whose disciples apparently do give to the poor when they have some extra money. Jesus is not saying, don't worry, be happy. What he's most likely doing is quoting Deuteronomy. And in the translation, it got cut off. Poor persons will never disappear from the earth. That's why I'm giving you this command. You must open your hand generously to your fellow Israelites, to the needy among you, and to the poor who live with you in your land. That's Deuteronomy 15. Jesus can do both. He can say, care for the poor in your midst and allow this extravagant gesture. He can do both. Let's not forget what it's like in that room, though, right in this moment. The perfume thick in the air. Jesus, his feet tenderly anointed and cared for. And Mary, her hair now carrying that rich fragrance with her as she goes about her day. The guests sitting around momentarily made quiet by the extraordinary display. And the first thing Jesus says is, the first thing, leave her alone. She was keeping this for the day of my burial. Lazarus' death and rising to new life are the backdrop for this story. But it's Jesus' own death in this gospel only about a week away that keeps pushing its way back into the story, back into the room. Jesus is here because he knows that moment of glory is approaching, God's glory, that moment when the Son of God will be raised up on the cross. That moment when his arms outstretched will signal an embrace that transcends time and space, God's radical welcome for all. 
The end of Jesus' path is drawing near. This is the same path he has been walking faithfully, resolutely, on these very same feet. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of the messenger who announces peace, who brings good news, who announces salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. The Jesus we meet in John's gospel has been clear from the beginning. Like that formula we learn in high school for writing essays, tell them what you're going to tell them, then tell them, then tell them what you told them. That's what happens all through the Gospel of John. From the first moment we see Jesus, he's identified as the Lamb of God, which is this vivid, disturbing image that places Jesus right at the center of the Passover offering, God's saving action for the Israelite slaves thousands of years earlier. From his first miracle, the changing of water into wine, wine, the cup of salvation, He signifies who he is. He tells us his mission. He tells us how it will be accomplished. His blood will be involved. And now we have witnessed the anointing of the Messiah, the Christ. Those two words, one in Hebrew, one in Greek, they mean anointed. His feet will take him there, these workhorses of even his body, the body of the one we believe is and was somehow at one with God. These feet will walk that path, the feet of the anointed one, blessed by Mary who sought to answer the question, what do you offer in thanksgiving for life itself, and who concluded only the most extravagant offering would do. Thanks be to God. Amen.